We're in Malibu because, it, as it turns out, you're on the road. But we picked a really pretty location. We, we hope it meets your approval. We think it's beautiful. You say it is, but... I just, you know, I, I love traveling and I, I love seeing the world, but I think that in, there's something about the English coastline that I think because we, that's our holiday when we're kids, like we drive to the coast and sit in the cold and eat fish and chips in the rain. And it's, <laughs> that does it's not very, sound fun to me, Ed. But I think it's a cultural thing. I think it's, a, I guess, yeah, it's very difficult to like explain it and have people go, oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah sounds, I want to do that. That great, but... Yeah, it is like, I, I had an Australian mate that I brought there and his idea of the beach is like sandals and shorts. So he wore sandals and shorts and it was January, which is usually hot in yeah, Australia. Yeah, yeah. And he like almost froze to death. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, you have a song on the album called England. Yeah. Which makes me, if I, if I was from the UK, I would say, yes, Ed, yes. Because I think you captured the UK very well. Thank you. And what I, it means to you. Well, I wrote it, so where I made Subtract, so basically I'd gone in with Aaron to make variations. And we had this like clear idea of like, Elgar has this, uh, who's a, a British composer, has right. this like, uh, these things called Enigma variations, which is 14 uh, pieces of music that he composed about his friends. And my dad had told me about this and I was like, that's a great idea. No one's done a modern version of this. So I said to Aaron, let's make this. We went in to start making that. And then whilst we were making that, uh, you know, Jamal died and, and Cherry had a tumour and, and et cetera, et cetera. And I made Subtract in yeah. the sort of month yeah. that I was meant to be making variations. But we'd already started variations. But it was written by the English coastline like Subtract. So England was, you know, literally we were in where it is, you know, like... Uh, homes pr protruding from stones with their wood coloured black and it you know there was that's basically where we were in in England in a place called Dungeness in Kent. I want to get to your music but I just want to go back a little bit because I like your description of yourself a speckly ginger haired kid with the glasses who stutters that kid normally would not become a pop star but here you are I mean we're kind of sitting on the top of the world here and you really do feel to me that you're sitting on the top of the world how does it feel to you at this time? I think if I look back at the last 13 years of my career, it makes sense. But mm. I think if you look at the start and look at where I am now, it doesn't make sense. But I think with the, I can, I could tell you all the building blocks that it took to get here. And that's why I feel like it's like, oh, it makes, it makes sense. Like these are the venues I played here and then this is the venues I played here. And then I had this song become a hit in, in this year. So it does make sense. But if you look at me at 10, and me at 32, there's, there's quite a like big gap of difference. He's still cute though, Ed. <laughs> do you do your own hair? Uh, I actually looked do in the you mirror do today the and yeah. I went, I went, oh, I think I need a haircut. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, I'm probably a bit too late because I'm coming on Gail King today. But, yeah. but, but it's now, don't you think your hair has sort of become your trademark? Oh, 100%. Because you, you do it yeah. yourself. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like I would say my hair was my trademark when I was like 17 and doing the London circuit because I would, I play with a tiny guitar and I'd have this sort of mad ginger hair. I was a bit fat back then. And people would know me as the fat ginger kid who played small guitar and it became my I don't know, USP, I guess. But, yes. Yeah. The, the fat ginger kid that plays the small guitar, that is not how anybody thinks of you now. And I, no, that is not. That is not, that is not how anybody <laughs> I'm thinks sure of you now. sure there are some people. No, 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 no. <laughs> and I just wonder what this must feel like to you. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But I love, I, I marvel that you were able to put out two albums, really, in one year. And all of your music feels, I know Subtract was very personal, but this also feels very personal to me. Yeah, do you know, so the, the, the sort of main inspiration of this record was uh, me, and, me and Cherry cook a lot and we always put on the same sort of records. It's like Nora Jones' Come Away With Me or Jack Johnson In Between Dreams and stuff. And I was always like, I don't, I don't have a record like this that's just like one, one producer, one mood, one feel. And so that was very much wanting to go in and create a sort of autumnal feeling of 14 stories about my friends and I think it I guess it Aaron describes it as subtracts eccentric cousin and it is I feel <laughs> it's a like obviously it's a happier record there's there's a few more sort of cheery love songs on it but it very much lives in the world of of that I think yeah, but there was a couple lines that I thought, is Ed okay? Because there's, there's one thing that says, when am I going to be all right? 
oh, I've been all night thinking about dying. And of course, Ed, I take everything you say so yeah. literally. And I thought, should we be worried about Ed? Is he okay? I'm, I'm serious. It, I was it came wondering. from, so that came from a, uh, a conversation with a, a school. So they're all written about my close friends, friends back. Well, apart from one, one song is um, American Town is basically mine and Cherry's story. Um, when Will I Be Alright was a conversation that I had with um, one of my school friends who was really, really going through it. Uh, and he had big ups, big downs. Um, and yeah, he said that he stays up late at night and wonders whether, whether he should be here or not. And that's, that's essentially where the in, in, inspiration came. But you seem to be in a good place in your life, true? Yeah, I feel like, t yeah, 2023 is definitely a lot better than, uh, a lot better than 2022. Two. Two. Um, but I feel my uh, routine in America has been great because I play a theatre on a Friday and a stadium on a Saturday and then I'm in studio five days a week so I'm having a really creative summer whilst being able to come and then you know go to Minneapolis and play a stadium there it's been, it's been, been really cool. I read that you write songs every day, true? Every day, well uh, every weekday I go in at 10am 10, yeah, 10 to 5pm uh, and it's sort of like a routine and my way of viewing it is like if I write say 15 songs a week like maybe maybe 15 songs a week and then in that month you have 15 times four <laughs> 60. <laughs> let's see I didn't 15 finish times four uh, yes. <laughs> uh, and you have one song that's amazing mm -hmm. when the year ends you have an album of amazing songs so that's that's my way of viewing it this year um whereas like Autumn Variations and Subtract were very much like, we probably wrote 50 songs and then picked 14 of the best ones. Whereas like Divide would be two, 300 songs and Equals would be like two, 300 songs. So that, those, um, the one, these, th these records are a much different way of uh, creating. When you're walking through the world, are you always looking for lyrics to songs or it just Occasionally, comes? yeah, occasionally. Like my I friends, was struck by that. My friends, uh, <laughs> My friend just got divorced for the second time and he had this line that I thought was brilliant. He's like, I started out with nothing and I still got most of it left. <laughs> it's like, that's such a great line. <laughs> yeah, I can relate to that too. I can relate to that too. But I'm fascinated by your process of writing your songs. I, I, I marvel that you were in the studio every weekday still writing at this pace. Yeah. Well, I ca considering who you are, Ed. I don't see it as work, though. I, you I, don't, I, I don't have hobbies. My hobbies are making music and being on stage, and, and that's what they always were. And I think that's why you work so hard, is because it's not work. You're like, I really enjoy creating. The buzz that you get from, I wrote a song yesterday, and the buzz that you get from the first initial, like, oh, this could be really good, is like, it's the best feeling in, in the yeah. world. I mean, it's pr probably matched by being on stage. And then, so these two things are just things that I want to constantly do. And I think having the setup of like, it being a routine allows you to live a life around it. So t I work regular hours. I, I go in at 10, finish at five, and then you can do so I don't know. I know so many people that do studio and they go in at like 6 p.m. Yeah. And I'm like, well, when, when and they work through the night. Yeah. When do you ever hang out with your mates or anything? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they work through the night. I like what you said. You just casually said, you know, I wrote a song yesterday. I wrote three yesterday. <laughs> I wrote three songs yesterday. What makes a good song to you? Because sometimes the songs that I think make the album you didn't think were good that are major hits. So I'm curious what makes a good song For to me, you? I think it's all feeling like if it makes me feel something um, and yeah, I think that I, you know, I have, I have this conversation with my fans all the time because people will ask at like Q&As, they'll be like, do you make music for your fans? And I think, I think if you do that, you end up making the wrong sort of music because you're trying to appease people. I think for me, the only uh, gut, re you have to follow your gut reaction. So if I'm like, I like this, then that's kind of the first step. But we were saying earlier, there's a song on this album called Punchline that yes. I didn't really, I sort of wrote it and I was like, yeah, it's yes. all right. And then everyone around me was like, this is really good, you should put it on. So sometimes I'm I can't I'm wrong. help but love you so. Mm. I love that. Thank you. I can't take this letting go. Thank you. You like my voice? I do, I love it, I love it. You should feature on it. <laughs> Your nose is growing, Pinocchio. Have you done, um, have, you, have you sung on anyone's record? Done? You, you got jokes, Ed Sheeran? No, no, I'm, I'm wondering. Are you asking me? I've got people that like <laughs> sing. My, my security guard sings backing vocals on my Christmas song with them. Um, and, you know, I hope Kev doesn't mind, but Kev can't really sing. But we put them in there and we tuned them in. Oh, my God. I would love to be a background vocal. Let's do it. 
Let's do it. I, I, genuinely, genuinely. No, let's, don't let's, threaten let's do me it. with a good time. I'm serious. No, I would but, love we, to do honestly, it. Honestly, I do songs all the time. But where I have I'll a have... terrible voice. Terrible. But I would love to do it. We can sort you out. But you could help me. I got you. Can I talk about plastic bag? What does plastic bag mean? What does that song mean? Uh, when it says love in a plastic bag, it's actually about. It's about ecstasy. That's what it's about. Like, and again, about a friend's. It's it, the song isn't actually about about me. W weirdly enough, the the my friend died. It's been years still grieving. Isn't actually about about Jamal. Jamal. It's about a friend of mine. Oh, it's not okay. No, but I mean, it it kind of goes in the same umbrella of of feelings. Like it's 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 a song that I relate to because of the stories. But everyone's lost someone. But yeah, the lyric is um, Saturday night is giving me a reason yeah. to rely on the strobe, strobe light, lights. the lifeline of a promise in a shot glass, and I'll take that if you're giving out love from a plastic, plastic bag. bag. Basically, just being out trying to make yourself feel happy again mm -hmm. and that being one of the the things is it hard to write about um songs when your friends are going through painful things you said it's actually yeah it's is weird it... i find it so i find the best songs that i've ever written are the ones that make me feel the most uncomfortable uh, and and sometimes it's from having a friend's story and writing a song and then being like my my best mate's mum dies in the in the pandemic, and I wrote a song that day about ben, it. Yeah. And um, what song did you write? Uh, it was called I will I will uh, I will remember you, and mm -hmm. I wrote the song. And then uh, he, you know, they had a small uh, funeral for his mum, but obviously it was COVID, so so no one did. And, and then they did a celebration of life for her, maybe like two two years later. Yeah. And I said to him, I was like, look, I wrote this song the day that your mum passed away and I didn't want to play it to you at the time because it was, it was like super heavy. Um, but like, here it is anyway. And, oh, wow. and then they, they ended up using it at the celebration of life. And he was like, oh, I'm so glad I have this song and blah, blah, blah. But, oh. but sometimes it's uncomfortable in those situations because it's real life. It's not this fabricated thing that like playing eyes closed to Jamal's mum and sister for the yes. first time. It's like, that's not a joyous occasion where you're like, I've written this great song. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's uncomfortable. And, being able to but be the like the lyrics are beautiful. Thank though. you. Your eyes closed. But I like still putting see that you. in, put, putting that in front of people who are living that situation and being like, this is going to be very public. I hope that's okay. So, but those for me are the best songs, the ones that are uncomfortable. You know, the ones that I've written about like my grandmother and my grandfather and having to play them to my father, or writing songs about my dad and playing it to my dad. Like, like those are the best songs, the ones that actually are gut from the gut. I think on this album for me, well, I'm, it starts with magical, so I'm yeah. sort of hooked at the beginning. Thank you. Uh, isn't this what love feels magical? There's something about the word magical that mm. I that I I like, so that resonates with me. But what does that song mean to you? That was, I guess, as soon as I'd written that song, Aaron played me the instrumental, and I. You know, it's a very simple song for me to write. Yeah. Like I, uh, I usually put a lot of words in in songs, and I just found myself just sticking on one note and just trying to be like, wouldn't it be cool if like a verse had like six words in it, and then the chorus had like six words? And it's just, it's a very very simple song, but I wanted to make this. Uh, I wanted it to feel like fairy dust, like this magical thing that's that that, 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 that started the um, started the record and. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that's my favorite song. I'm usually wrong with these. That's things, your though, favorite so it, song. I think so. Yeah. Okay. That or um, Head Then Heels. I reckon they're like the last. The, the that's last the one. last one. Yeah. You said you're normally wrong about what? Say. I'm usually wrong about songs. So I was like, <laughs> Magical's the one, and then I started playing the. I've done been doing these fan pop-ups, and I started playing the songs to fans, and they're like, We really like American Town, and I'm like, Yeah, I'm probably I'm probably wrong here. No, but Magical, you did a pop-up. For a, you crashed a wedding. I did crash a wedding. Yeah, yeah. Now, t tell me what your thought goes in when you do something like that. Well, I mean, every week we've been in different cities, and I was just sort of like, I want to go and do the thing in the city, and then, you know, my mate Doug, who's on tour with me, was like, well, we might as well film it. So I was like, I'm, I'm going to go and get a cheesesteak in Philly, and he was okay. like, well, why, well, why don't you serve the cheesesteaks? And I was like, well, that yeah, I like saw you that. It. So yes. you, it, for, for me, it was just going to do a tourist thing as a Brit in a city and then it sort of turned into this thing um, so when we were in Vegas it was you know the thing you do in Vegas you go to the little chapel that Elvis <laughs> is at and yeah and I was like uh, we I mean we we pre uh, looked at who was so they were actually fans getting married I didn't just crash two people who were like why is this guy oh, oh, oh you knew that they were Ed Sheeran fans yeah 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 oh yeah. okay yeah yeah but 
I think anytime you walk in, I don't care whether they're an Ed Sheeran fan, you walk in with your Ed Sheeran face, people are going to be very glad to see you. It's true. It's true, Ed. They are. Look at everybody. That. They're going to be very glad to I'm see you. I'm not deluded. I'm a realist. But, but, I, I know that if I'm walking in somewhere, people are like, <laughs> this is our wedding day, man. What are you doing? Like, if they're like Motorhead fans, but, and they've, they're like, I don't want thinking out loud at my wedding. I want the Ace of Spades. But you do seem to cultivate... Um, you seem to care about the fans. People always say that, but you do seem to want to engage with them. I think is a better way to say it. I think, yeah, it's a for me. For me, I mean, this album more than more, more than anything is. Uh, I think I will. I, I'm kind of doing it on my own record label, so I was like, I'm going to make it as fan first as possible, um, because that you know, I'm. It's not. It's not in a big machine. It's sort of like going to. I like I did the, the the live album at fans' houses. Fans are making the music videos, um, and it just I don't know. I, f I feel like I have a very close relationship with my fans. I think because uh, I've never really been separate from them. There's never really been when I first started touring. After the gigs, I would go out and meet everyone that had been at the gigs, at every single gig. So I've sort of known all these people for like for about 13 years, and it feels just like one community. I never understand when people become famous and they're walking with their heads covered up or they're like, no, 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 because this is what you work so hard to do. Yeah. And you said early on when you were starting that I don't think you dreamt of being a pop star. I think you just wanted to sing. Yeah. And well, your thing seemed to be, I'll work, as har I'll work harder than anybody I know. Being a pop star has kind of happened by accident because I, I never saw the music that I made as pop because it was I was just a kind of acoustic singer songwriter and then it becomes pop because it becomes popular and then you're sort of in that that sphere but I never really saw it kind of playing out like that I guess um, do you like being called a pop star 100% yeah I love it yeah I don't think it's a dirty word and even I, like, I don't either even don't like either. pop pop like I when I grew up Backstreet Boys and Britney Spears were stuff that I listened to regularly so I, I've never been like oh pop yeah and I feel like people lie when they say they don't like it. I th because it, you can't you can't be in a bar, couple of beers in, and I want it that way comes on and not be like, <laughs> this so is a good time. You can't. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I do. And <laughs> I don't know. Even grown ass men, it's so true. Do you know true. what I mean? Yeah. Yes. Do you know what yes. I mean? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I think um, <laughs> I really enjoy the position uh, that I'm in with my fans because they're all like. I, uh, seeing them sort of grow up as well and they've all sort of got individual tastes and what they like about my music but I think that's what's nice about the big gigs is no one's there just for perfect or just for shape of you it's like people like the the, overall the range arc of it. Yeah, yeah you have such a range but that's the other thing about you Ed you're doing country you're doing mm. you know you're doing r and I, I think it's hard to just pigeonhole you into one genre because you seem to be able to do... Do you believe in genres, though? Because I think it's good music or bad music. Or bad I music. I feel like, I, especially now, like, genres when I was a kid were so important. It was like, it was your identity at school. It was like, what sort of bands do you listen to? Or what sort of artists do you listen to? Whereas now, it's like, pl the playlist generation is like, I like everything. If it's good, I like it. If it's bad, I don't like it. And I've, I feel like that's, yeah. I think, you I don't think... See it. I don't know. I, I would have just never thought you with country. But it works. Well, That's I, lived, what I, mean. I lived in Nashville for a couple of I years. Know you so did. I, I yeah. kind of, and before that, I was never really exposed to country. It was never. Really, it's getting really big in in England now, but it never really was a thing in mm. in England. And for me, like, I just love being in different places and soaking in different cultures. And that could be like anywhere in in the world. And I feel like in Nashville, the culture is country music. So I lived there, and I was like. Oh wow! This is there's some really really good stuff going on here. Well, I mean, I first heard of you because uh, uh, Taylor Swift. I've seen her. Went to her last last concert. I've been to all of them actually, and it was in New Jersey. And you were on stage with her, mm. and we were backstage. And you had just been on stage. Um, change. What is it? Change. Everything's changed. Everything's yeah. changed. Yes, I know. All I know. I love that video. <laughs> I love that song. And you came and knocked on the door, and you said, um, "Excuse me, uh, may I get a sandwich?" <laughs> And we were just like, dude, you just got off the stage. You were just so, so polite and so unassuming. And I just thought, but you're the star here. We're like, what kind of sandwich do you want, Mr. Sheeran? I mean, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm in awe of your humility still, still. Where, where does that come from? 
I mean, and people that know you, uh, or close to you, I know this is not an act, Ed. Oh, no, no. This is really you. Where does this come from, this... Well, I think, I think, my, I, mean, I mean, my dad was really strict on me when I was a kid, and it was, was say your pleases and thank yous and be, and be polite. And, but I think the humility side of it is, like, I don't think you need to have an ego outside of stage. I think when you're on oh. stage, you have to have an ego, because you can't be, yeah. don't look at me, you have to be like, who wants, I am, yeah, yes. who, wants to be, who wants to be entertained? But you have to switch that off when you get off stage, like, because it would be weird. Uh -huh. to walk around being like I am Ed Sheeran oh God, yeah <laughs> so I feel like yeah ego ego I think is a uh, a thing that you 100% have to have confidence in your ability when you are in front of large audience audiences but I've yeah I just find that I don't I wouldn't carry it elsewhere uh -huh. it's not something that yeah I don't know is like especially like when you're with people like if I go home with my school friends and I have any ounce <laughs> of that. They'll, they'll put yeah, you. you are ripped to And I actually, probably the answer is uh, growing up in England, because success isn't as celebrated as it is in the the, the U.S. The States. Um, mm -hmm. And it's kind of like England loves an underdog, and then once you get above your station, then they'll try and tear you back down. Mm -hmm. But then there's a certain point that you reach like national treasure status. That's yes. where like Elton is now. Chris Martin's entering into that now. I'm not quite there yet. But you so just got the OBE, didn't you? I got uh, an MBE, yeah. An MBE. Yeah. Uh, or the British Empire. That doesn't mean national treasure status. Though. <laughs> that just means the government are like, you're doing good charity work. Yeah. Is, is fame hard for you? Uh, I think, it, no. Uh, I think it's difficult with children um, because I just want to be a dad sometimes and uh, I find myself not being able to do dad things mm -hmm. um, like take them to the zoo and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that or like I found it like there was a, a while though where I was like taking my daughter to the park and pushing her on a swing in a ski mask which was a bit <laughs> In a ski Intense, mask. Intense, yeah. But, you know, people would be looking, who is this weirdo? <laughs> but um, you're just trying to protect your identity. You, you all don't share pictures. No, of no, no, no. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No way, no way. And, like, I, and I, actually, I think it's really strange when people try and take pictures of me with her. Because mm. I, like, yeah, I just think it's, uh, I would never take a picture of someone else's kids. Kids, because you're yeah. the public person. They are not. Yeah. yeah. And I, so, so that's the thing. So fame-wise with me, I've signed up for it. I'm living it. Uh -huh. Goods and good, good and bad. But yeah, mm -hmm. I find it I, it's challenging being a, a a father and trying to do normal father things. Yeah, but you're the ultimate girl dad now. Yes. You're the only you're the only male in your home. Yeah. Yeah. What yeah. Is dad Actually, oh, we've got you? two girl cats as well. Yeah. So there I you re go. really am, and two female pigs. So we are. <laughs> yeah, and five female goats. Wow, I really am, really am the only guy. Yeah. But you must like what what is I love it. what does dad mode mean to you being a girl dad? What does that mean? Even your bracelet says girl dad yeah. that someone gave you. Yeah. <laughs> um I don't know. I think uh it's sort of too early to say. They're both quite young, but I love it. When I talk about your fame, because you've been very candid about you had dealt with drug issues, you had dealt with alcohol issues, and you said now you've given all of that up. Still true? Yeah, I mean I've I, I, I'm still I still love red wine. Um mm -hmm. and that's my treat. Mm -hmm. And I feel like red wine is not a drink that you can <laughs> over, you can't like wake up at. Well, I mean, maybe, maybe you could. For me, red wine is, is an evening thing. Yeah, so. but it's no longer an issue or problem for you is what I no, mean. No, no, no. That's no. what I mean. It's no. no longer an issue or a problem for I'm you. I'm just, I, I don't have a, I don't have an off switch and I love, okay. I love doing things in excess. Um, so I have to, I, m moderation is my daily thing. Mm -hmm. Food, drink, work. <laughs> trying to moderate work. Like, I, I just love going, 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 going. I have a hard time with moderation when it comes to anything with icing on it. But you had <laughs> talked about after Jamal died, Cherry said this too, that maybe you should think about getting therapy, and you did. Yeah. What did you get from therapy? What were you looking for, and what did you get? Uh, I think I was looking for a uh, sounding board of someone who wasn't going to... Uh, because I often get, if I'm like speaking to friends, like I live a, a, a extremely privileged life and uh, complain, not even complaining, but talking about it's being depressed about my friend dying. My friends would be like, obviously 
look at the life you live though and you've got these two kids and a yeah. wonderful wife and a wonderful I, and I know they're trying to make me feel better but sometimes you just want to have someone to speak to and be like I don't know why I feel this sad yeah. you know yeah and, and and understands that yeah it's like what people say money uh, doesn't solve all your problems and normally it's wealthy people who are saying that but it really is true I find that money... such a weird thing because I like no no one wants to hear that basically no that isn't it that because people would be like oh, okay but it kind of does and yeah so it's i'm i'm very much a uh it's more it's it's more the um for me the first time i felt comfortable talking about it i think was because of what cherry had gone through and losing jamal were two things that money can't solve you can't buy back your dead yes. friends you know so um, no matter who you are yeah, yeah. so yeah, i yeah. think that was the first time i was like comfortable talking about it yeah and so how do you feel today in terms of mental health? And I know you're not trying to be a poster boy, but I think it's so important that we talk about this. Yeah. That people understand, look, we all go through stuff is, is the point I'm making. I think the, th the, key, the key to it is always be kind to people because you don't know what they're going through. You don't know, you don't know what's happened in their day. Something, you, they, something might have happened 10 minutes before you, you've spoken to them. And I think that's the... Um, that's the key, you know. You could be, you could, you could see someone be mean to someone, and that person that they've been mean to might go home that day and have a, have really, really dark thoughts, and maybe go through with something that they might not have gone through if that person hadn't been mean to them that that day. So I think the key, the, I think the key to the starting the conversation around mental health is just be nice to people throughout yes. your day, you know, and try and like if you are having a bad day, talk to someone about it. Yes, and guess what, Ed? It's not hard to be nice to people. Mm. It really isn't. Sometimes it can be if you're having a really bad day, though. But it's better to have a conversation with someone about why you're feeling that yeah, way rather yeah, if than you're, you're right. You're right. You're right. I take that back. If you're if you're having a bad day, it is hard. But generally speaking, but it's speaking, better to say to someone. So I I had a conversation the other day, and someone someone had lashed out at me, and my instant reaction was, like, and and Cherry actually said, "Well, you don't know what's going on. You should just talk to him." And I spoke I spoke to him, and he was having a really tough time at that at that point and 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 he was like oh but i would never say anything i was like but it's much better than just lashing out you know because yeah. having a conversation with someone so that they can actually understand well, the well, whole story you know cherry's better than i because if someone lashes out me i don't think maybe they're having a bad day yeah <laughs> yeah it's good to have a sounding board chess is um <laughs> chess is great for that you know yeah i think actually i think cherry is your secret weapon honestly yeah what is she what what is she brought you said your life is infinitely better with her in it yeah well I was, and very, became I was better. very I was very lonely before she came along because mm -hmm. I worked the whole time um, and there wasn't really anyone to share any moments with so I would like so for instance I played Wembley Stadium last year and I walked off stage and it, she was in my dressing room and we had a beer and went that was great in a bowl of chips or whatever uh, whereas before I would just come off and then sit in the dressing room and then maybe go out to bar afterwards and it's more like for those moments having someone who's kind of your partner in crime that yes. you're you're building this thing with but then also like now obviously having a family like we always talk about uh, the days that are difficult with the kids are infinitely easier when you have someone to sort of look at and go yeah l you know, life is always a, better yeah. when shared always always what does this album mean to you that it's the first one on your own label? Uh, yeah, it's kind what of does weird. That I, mean? haven't, I haven't put out anything without a big record label since 2010. So I used to release stuff on, there's a, uh, a, a thing called TuneCore that you would uh, pay I don't know, $20 to and they'd put it on iTunes. And that, so that would be how I released my music before. So this one, it's fun because it's more, uh, you just have to think of cooler ideas because you you're not having the extra help, I guess. Um, and I'm what? not saying like I think I think I'm gonna re-sign to the record Atlantic. label that I was on. Yeah, I just mm -hmm. I in in between I was like I really I used to do the independent thing all the time, and I really feel like that's an itch I want to scratch, and maybe this is gonna be my one opportunity to to do that. I guess I've got to like manage my expectations with this record because each record before I've done like all the big going in and doing all these radio interviews and going on the late night shows and doing doing all this stuff and this record there's not even a single for it there's not there's not a music video I'm just putting there out isn't, there isn't no 
No, I mean there, there there will be a song eventually that people go, we like this the best. But what? I'm not saying this is the first single, this is the music video. It's basically it's a record that is and as a whole. Just putting it out. Yeah. Well, that's kind of scary then. I, there's no video <laughs> out. There's no. No, video? no. I've just got to manage Whoa. my expectations. For me, it's like. Why are you doing it this way then? Why are you doing it like bec that? I feel because they're. I, well, I want to put out an independent record, and also like I've had. 12, 13 years of the, being a pop star and having the pressure of it has to sell this week one, yeah. you have to have this hit single, you have to have this. And part of me goes, why? Like, what? all of my favorite artists Cause, aren't. Because it's a business. Yeah, but my favorite artists in the world are not. They didn't have 17 number one albums in a row. Elton John had like a number one and then maybe a number 26 and then maybe a number nine. And, and the, it's kind of got to a point in the music industry where everything has to be the biggest and best every time and then better the next time. And for me, the, what I experienced with Subtract was like, people really liked the record yes. and no one was talking about chart this or chart that, yeah. but they liked the record much more than other records that I've had that have broken records and stuff. So for me, it's more, clearing the slate a little bit of like this is a record I really like and I might come back and do pop and when I come back and do pop like set your expectations like for me uh, but with this one it's just so so you sometimes don't... you should just make music and put it out rather than like make it and then strategize so you don't feel pressure with this album coming out I feel I've had to I, I think that's part of the independent thing is like that sort of takes away the pressure of like that there are no expectations because there's no company being like. How did how did you yeah, do it? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's um yeah, it kind of takes it away. I just have you just have to live with it. You just have oh. to be like I don't care what but, people think because people are gonna see it and they're gonna see it being a lower figure than my other records and be like, oh he's on the way out. That's but that that's you just have to. You can't, you just can't you can't go like this for your entire career. You have to have moments of like just doing things because you want to do them and living with the fact that it isn't going to be like divide or like and you're really okay you really don't care in terms of with this one i've really i'm 100 percent yeah 100%. I, I, when i set out if i've set out if i like if i've made a song like bad habits and i put it to radio and i do you know the 200 radio interviews and i've done all the liners and i'm you know uh, and you you want it to be a hit if it isn't yeah. then you can be disappointed. But I think when you're putting out uh, a, an album of songs that I just like them. That I just like. And I don't know, it's like maybe one of them will be a hit. And if they are, then great. Magical. <laughs> no, yeah. this, you could say this is my offering to you. American, American Town is, is It's also, very much, a fa but that's the thing. It's a fan focused it's product. It's, it's, at the, it's the end of a tour. Um, and I'm just saying, here's a record I made. Um, but, yeah. but, but I read that you said that even now, you still feel you have to prove yourself. No, what I do you have to prove? I ch well, you have to prove that you can still do it. You know, you have to like, if I get up on stage and I'm, people are like, oh, he wasn't as good as we thought he was. If I really, you know, you have to, and find different ways of doing different songs. Like I can't make perfect again, because it's already there. So people would just be like, oh, this is just perfect again. So you have to find different ways of saying the same sort of thing time and time again and fine but that's what's exciting to me that's what's exciting about making this new music is the directions that you can take have to be more and more left because you've already gone in these yeah. directions like bad habits for me i'd never made a song that sounded like bad habits so that was like a new direction but now i can't do that again i've got to do something different see that's what i wonder about the pressure of a songwriter all the music all the notes how do you still come up with something that's never been done before you, i would think that would be hard well everything's been done before Everything. Everything? Everything, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, your court case kind of proved that. I mean, the fact that you won that case. You scared yeah. us all when you said, if I lose this case, I'm not going to make music anymore. We're like, eh, don't say I that. I was serious about that. I was serious about that. I know I, you I, were. I wouldn't, I, I, I would have stopped And I wanted writing. you to take it back. I would have stopped writing music. I probably would have carried. You would have stopped writing well, I music. I often say to people, I'm like, life would be so much simpler if I just covered songs. <laughs> just like... Just cover tunes. You don't have to do five days but of studio so a week. Good, but you're so good, though. You don't want that's to That's not what's fun to me. The fun yeah. thing is the creating stuff. Yeah. Know? That's the fun stuff. Uh, but yeah, I would have. I would have stopped you writing. You really would have. Yeah, because it just like, how can you go into the studio and have things, chords that are off limits? It's so weird, and be told that by, people that don't make music. You know. <laughs> Does it change the way you write music or you approach your music, that court case? No. No. Okay. No. You have, a, everything gets put through a musicologist before it's released, so you have a kind of like, 
So I, and I do film every single session, but, but no, no, it t that just takes the joy away from it. And that's what I wanted to make clear is like, you can't, you, like songwriting is a culture and all the songwriters I know, it's, a, it's an understood thing. You go in the studio and you just create and it's, and it's fun. And those sorts of things are really like damaging, I think, to that. Okay, songwriting. Well, yellow is my favorite color. Just makes me happy. It's a color of butter and sunshine. Uh, Gail is my name. And let's see what song you come up with. Cool. <laughs> I'm, get, I'm getting you on a song. I really am. I would love to do that.